Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your patience. Uh, I'm Lubna Boarfa. I'm here today uh, to talk about the power of machine learning and AI, um, and mainly in solving real-world problems. Um, so who I am, I'm a co-founder of Okna Technologies. Um, it's a startup that revolutionized the way evidence is generated for pharma. Our main goal in Okra is to build trust uh, of patients within the healthcare system and provide the best drug and therapy for the patient. Prior to co-founding Okra, I worked for nine years implementing machine learning solutions, mainly for healthcare and uh, also other applications. In these nine years, I implemented seven machine learning prototypes and three made it to uh, real world, working in uh, hospitals and other organizations. Next to uh, my career, I'm a pattern lover, which I uh, talk later about it. So what we do in Okra, everything we do uh, in my startup, we believe that the shortest path to your patients is never a straight line. And we apply machine learning algorithms to find uh, the best drug for patients, even in, when they are outliers. And machine learning is uh, the theory that provides us with the tools to teach computer how to find this short path, which is never a short line to our patients. Uh, so we have a, a cloud-based platform um, that runs machine learning algorithms in, uh, in the cloud. We take as input data any real-world data, not coming from a lab, but coming from social media, AMR data from hospitals, or claims data, and we process that data, and we, our output is mainly a prediction score, how likely an outcome is, how likely the patient will respond, how likely uh, the patient likes the therapy, and the outcomes we predict, you cannot see it very clearly, but are ma mainly related to patient outcomes and perceptions, as well as the effectiveness of, of the drugs and the therapies. So besides my career, I said I'm pattern lover. I'm trying to be a conscious person. I love to think, uh, and since early years, I love patterns. Patterns in architecture, patterns in music, patterns in people, and in behavior. And uh, I like to quote um, a quote from a novel called The Survivor, which I um, uh, believe in uh, very well. There are only patterns. Patterns on top of patterns. Patterns that affect other patterns. Patterns hidden by patterns. Patterns within patterns. If you watch close, history does nothing but repeat itself. What we call chaos is just patterns we haven't recognized. What we call random is just patterns we cannot decipher. What we can't understand, we call nonsense. What we can't read, we call gibberish. There is no free will, there are no variables. So not surprisingly, I did my PhD in pattern recognition. So what you see here is work I devoted for four years of my life trying to understand surgical behavior. So what you see here is signals I extracted from surgery using the instruments and built a machine learning system that can track what protocol steps the surgeon is executing. So in this way, we build a machine that can understand the surgeon. What is he doing? And at the same time, derive a consensus, which is the first line what you see here, the perfect surgery that never happens. And from this perfect surgery, from this consensus, we can compute all the anomalies and the outliers for every execution and ask the surgeon why these things happen. So I'm pattern recognizer and I want to talk to you today about the, path, the part of machine learning that fundamentally changed my perception of things and really changed the way how I live, how I mother, and how I belong, and how I choose people for my inner circle. So it started when I was 20 year, uh, years old. 
a third year electrical engineering student. I studied three years long how to program machines to do exactly what I want, how to write code in PhDL, how to write assembly code, how to write object-oriented programming, and put the rules for the computer how to do exactly what I want. I was the expert that know everything. I didn't really enjoy it, especially not enjoying the part where I have to write so many exceptions because not always the rules work. Until one day, and I was third year, and all the uh, research groups, the professors from the research groups, come to pitch their research groups to us. And this professor, his name is Bob, he entered the room and he had 10 minutes to talk. And he said, here's the thing. In real world, if you become an expert in what you do, you, you are unable to explain it. You are unable to make your perceptions explicit. Because when you become expert about something, you can do it, but you actually don't know how you do it. So you have a consciousness problem. That was a bit weird. I said, what? I've been learning for three years to program machines to do exactly what I want. I've been learning that I am the expert that knows the rules. And now you're telling me that when I'm an expert, actually, I don't know how I do it. I don't know the rules how I do it. That was really frustrating. So I decided I'm going to do control engineering. I will learn how to put the rules more strict. And, and I tried it for three months. That was nothing to me. So I decided, OK, let's go and talk to him. And after the discussion, he told me about machine learning how we can teach machines to learn by themselves instead of telling them what to do. And I started getting excited. I said, OK, actually, this is so exciting. I want to I wanna learn how to hack those experts that are unconscious about what they do, about their um, expertise. I'm going to be a machine learning person, and I'm going to hack it. And I'm going to extract those rules, hidden rules, and lay it down for all the people and the machines to learn from. So I start from rational thinking. So I said, there is the hypothesis. Those experts, they see so many examples. For example, a doctor or a judge, he just sees so many examples, and he just hacked the rational rules behind the theory. He just understand everything about that phenomena. And um, I started studying about it. So when I started my PhD about surgeon, I said, those are experts in what they do. I'm going to take and extract all the rational thoughts behind it. So and I discovered this amazing theorem called the central limit theorem. How many of you heard about this before? Great. So this theorem said, if you see so many examples from real life, so many examples, so many people, and um, they are randomly sampled from each other, then actually, the more you see, the more beautiful this bell curve become, the more you can fit it in a nice normal distribution. And which means that we can generate consensus from, from those observations. Then we can fit this nice bell curve and we can extract everything we want. We can extract averages, medians, variances, and, and then we have a consensus. And that's the rational rules that experts have. I was so happy with my findings until the next slide, please. Until I realized by talking to surgeons that there are many, many times that the best strategies and the best rational decisions does bring you to um, a bad solution. So, um, before giving you this assignment, I will give you an example from uh, myself uh, five years ago. Um, we had a new baby and we, de we decided to go on holiday. So I wanted the, the holiday to be perfect. So I spent one month looking for the best holiday with a newborn baby. And I've been reading reviews and looking for all the uh, criteria around um, uh, family friendliness, uh, baby clubs, uh, swimming pool, and nice weather in March. And spending one month uh, while my colleague in the same office 
he decided to go on holiday and just took him two days and he made his decision and he started teasing me about trying to solve a multi-criteria optimization problem um, and then I found my perfect holiday it was perfect we went there it was exactly as uh, as we expect but happiness didn't follow and things happened our baby got sick and it was the worst holiday ever so I learned my lesson with gratitude, and you can expect how long it takes me today to book a holiday. I think a few hours, one day. So I want you, this is a workshop, I'm supposed to give some interactive uh, exercises. I want you to divide in teams, I think every row, and discuss in, in 10 minutes about an experience uh, that rational decisions leads you to an unsatisfactory experience, and to find out one reason why, what was the reason that it leads you to that? And we have 10 minutes and I will be walking to the group. Hi. Hi. Yeah. It's, it's just to find a reason. If, if this thing ever happened to one of you, what was the main thing that made it and unsuccessful because that leads us to the machine how we how we can derive that logic yeah so we have we have 10 minutes hi 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 yeah. So you understand the assignment? Yeah. So one experience from one of you, and just what is the, that reason that made it unsuccessful? that, that um, you made it on a rational decision, but actually it leads you to, to yeah. yeah, yeah. So, that would be so what is the reasons? I'm collecting reasons. What uh, do you have? Yeah, it's like the other day in surgery, like when yeah. I was in cataracts. Yeah. So when you take the lens out of the mm -hmm. eyes, um, like to stop the eyes from collapsing, you put like a viscous material yeah. in. And while I was doing that, the iris, so this lady had floppy iris. Yeah. So her iris came out mm -hmm. and that caused some minor trauma to the iris. And that basically, like from my point of view, like she, instead of her iris being nice and circular, yeah. she had like one side which is a bit zigzag. Yeah. Okay. So like, it wasn't perfect. Like, wasn't unexpected like, events. Unexpected. Yeah. I will. Yeah. So, uh, anyone who wants to share one of the reasons that we tried to discover here? Yeah. Okay. Uh, in 2007, after high school, I, uh, I decided to go to Russia to study aircraft engineering. But back then, it was only a Russian language, no English language in Russia. So. They told me there was a company here, uh, uh, Rakos company, it takes students to Russia. So they said, uh, you have to study first year language and after then you'll start normally the university. So I th said, is it enough this one year, preparatory year? They said, yeah, two months and you'll speak fluently Russian. So I went there first year, I was the best in my class. Uh, I was even watching movies, Russian movies from the first day. I was the best, I got five excellent and everything. So when I started uh, second year, like in the first lecture, even it's not engineering, it was history. I didn't understand the word. It was like I was surprised. So I decided not to continue. I can I have to understand everywhere in the in the lecture. And they were telling me like first six months it will it will be, you'll understand. But I decided not to continue. So I came back. So yeah, what was the problem? Like they told me it will be enough this one year, and it wasn't. I was the best in my class. Like. All foreign, uh, all foreigners like who go to Russia, they'll face the same problem. Like first six months, they'll not understand the word. It's uh, like 
like they told me it will be enough uh, this one year for they lied to me <laughs> because they are taking money they don't care whether you understand everything in lectures or not they think I'm like some others, they just need the degree. They go, to, no, I want there for the knowledge, not for the degree. So this is one of my like, experiences. Thank you for sharing. So it's an example of unreliable information. So here we have an, another example. Hi. Um, uh, a friend of mine recently uh, introduced me to football betting. So he told me I can make a lot of money from betting football. I'm a football fan by myself. So uh, you know Barcelona, they win every time. Whenever they face someone, you can go and see all the statistics about this team. So I decided to put a couple of hundred dollars in, in this. So they were facing a very uh, underestimated team. So uh, looking at the history of the winnings, so I said Barcelona is going to win like 3-0 or 4-0. So I put around $400, $500, expecting them to win. Unfortunately, they lost uh, during that match, and I lost my money. And what, that was my last time I invested in such thing. So. <laughs> thank, you, thank you for sharing. <laughs> Is the other friend in the room? <laughs> so we have one last. Uh, Well, for this not to be surprising, I guess it's university. So I ditched university a couple of times, then came back, thinking it would be the rational thing to do, you know, because we're in a place where, okay, we're supposed to have our degrees, we're supposed to do something, like, if whatever we want to do with our lives, that's what you need. Uh, that's what we're taught to do. However, if you look at the core of it, if you dissect the problem, which I guess th that's my main interest behind machine learning itself, you know, it, it teaches you to look into details of the problem. And I'm not learning anything that is beneficial to me. If I want to find a job, the job that I'm going to be finding is not correlated with the degree that I'm going to be getting anyway. So it would be a rational decision not to really end up being there. However, I'm still there. So I'm really disappointed. So thank you, everyone. Can we, can we see the next slide? So this, this is a slide from a paper from 1971. So it is um, about diagnostic classification accuracy of doctors that's been um, uh, exposed to many tests. So what you see here is the number of test results they've been, uh, they've been uh, seeing, and, and what you see on the i-axis is the accuracy of their diagnosis. This paper showed that actually when you show too much information, too much criteria to the human, he starts making wrong judgments. So when you have a lot of criteria to make your decision from and not clear, then you start making the wrong decision. And seeing same criteria but less gives you much more accuracy in decision making. And that's exactly in machine learning the same thing. What we call the curse of dimensionality. So when we train a machine learning algorithm with many parameters to predict, to predict an outcome, this is the error that the machine learning algorithm makes, and this is the number of uh, parameters we give him to train, the variables. So what we see is that the classification error decreases as more and more uh, parameters are um, uh, used by the system. But at some moment, if we increase the features, the error increases again, which means that's too much detail for the machine to handle. And it's so funny that both for people and for machines, that the curse of dimensionality is a problem. So, um, so the rules that I, I experience with rational decision making is that we, sh uh, as we learn from machine learning, we should select just few well-defined features, characteristics, ideally uh, um, around seven, and then choose a simple criteria, either yes or no, go in or not go in, um, and then. Um, a very um, a simple performance measure for the features. If it is sunny weather, um, if a number of uh, reviews is, is good, if the majority is good, and not too much. And that helps us to, to avoid the curse of dimensionality. But the other thing is, this is about the rationals. What about the emotion? The emotion is, is, is another problem because um, 
what the decisions we make based on emotion can lead us to totally uh, um, irrational criteria. So I can tell you example uh, for my for myself again. So I um, I was on 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 a diet for uh, for a while ago, and I was eating just specific um, uh, protein and fruits uh, uh, types, and then I was back um, with my husband to the city where we met in Delft, and we were walking in the Market Square, and we walked across this restaurant where we used to go, and then we looked inside, and and it looked so amazing, so. Uh, renovated and the food smells so good and we just get in and and then the people there they look just like us they studied in the same university it feels so good and then I look to the menu and, and my husband look at me I said there is nothing for you here oh, we can go but uh, we can just go uh, it, it feels so good and the French they have a very good expression for that c'était plus fort que moi it was much stronger than me I couldn't Stop, I, my husband is Dutch. He was looking like, really? Two weeks long, you're so strict at home and now you just eat what you want? And yeah, I just did and I really, really enjoyed it. So what happened out there? It was not, it was not my brain, it was, it was my gut feeling, it was my heart. And that's exactly in, uh, what they found in the study that, that there is the heart brain. The heart brain is, um, neurons from your heart or from your gut, there is a small portion of, in our brain, those neurons coming from those organs and that are controlling our decision making. And I think they are uh, controlling a lot on my decision making. Um, and there was a, another study which was really interesting. So they found out that um, Neuroscientists found out that people with brain damage and that lost the ability of feeling emotions, their decision-making process has become seriously impaired, which is really surprising given the fact that rational decision-making is a golden standard in our society. So, um, so actually, we need both. We need and the rational decision-making and the emotional decision-making. And that's what I called uh, the intuitive decision making. So one side approaches miss a lot of information. And that's not the answer. Um, so the key ingredient of expert decision making, back to the experts like surgeons and other experts, is the successful integration of these two, the rational and the emotional. But then looking back to my reasoning about the central limit theorem, which we go back to the next slide, if if there is emotion involved, if there is a heart, brain, neurons in our brain, which means that actually this normal distribution wouldn't fit because we cannot have randomized samples because every person we see, we, we judge, we, uh, we have a bias all the time because we have uh, those um, heart, brain, emotions everywhere. So actually, the central limit theorem doesn't work in a real world because we just happen to be humans. And um, which means that this nice bell curve has very, very long tails and that they might be going to infinity and that people like you and me might be here and we will never benefit from the um, expert decision making because we don't fit in this nice bell curve. But because he's expert, we might still give us a good judgment. But this makes a big dilemma for us because in a machine learning algorithm, we cannot use the central limit theorem because we will miss, the, miss all these people. So the thing we use in machine learning to automate a human expert's decision is called the pair matching. So what you see here is a photograph that needs to be matched against these two. So we need to train a machine learning algorithm to tell us how likely is this person to be this one and how likely is this picture to be this one. And uh, the distance measures we use, um, we call it pair matching. Next one. So when we apply the rational decision making and we fit a central limit theorem on the data, 
basically what we apply is the triangle inequality um, coming from the Pythagoras theorem, which says um, the, the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. Because if we have three points in space, it's much shorter to come from this point to this point other than through another point in, um, in space. And then um, this means if we apply a distance metric in, in machine learning, the distance between these two pictures should be smaller than the two distances um, uh, added to each other. So we have different machine learning metrics to measure this. We have Euclidean metrics, which are very strict, that uh, the side of, uh, of one of the triangle should be the sum of the two. We have known Euclidean metrics, which basically said it should be, uh, according to the triangle inequality, it should be less than the sum. And we have known Euclidean known metric algorithms, which basically violates the triangle inequality and says the shortest distance between two points is not a straight line. There was this paper in 2014, amazing work, published, um, and they did a meta-analysis across all the literature in pattern recognition and machine learning about what is the best for real world. Is it metric or non-metric approaches? And what they found is good recognition is non-metric. It basically doesn't satisfy the triangle inequality. Which, which says that the shortest distance between two points is not straight line, which says expert decision making doesn't fit a normal distribution. So they synthesized a lot of work under metric, non metric, and others, and the, the non metric approaches outstand all of the, uh, all of the uh, others. They, co they validated their work on different data sets coming from images, as this one. Um, and here I will give you examples from real world about um, where the triangle inequality doesn't apply. No. So this is, um, this is in Norway. This is two towns, V and G. I, I, I have the name there, but I don't remember. So they, they used to... Um, to be very close, and families have extensions there, but the, the, due to the snow, the glaciers become very high, and they couldn't travel anymore to see their families. So basically, um, they found a way, a shorter way, to get to, to the other town and see their families or see their girlfriends, and it's not straight line. It's not, the, the shortest distance here is not straight line. Another example is, in real life, when we have two men loving the same woman, they are both very close to her, but the distance between them, according to metric algorithms or metric distances, should be very close. They should be friends. But we know from real life this is not true. And another example, this is, by the way, an algorithm that we use in uh, image processing. Once we have a table with two objects on the table, there is a cup which is touching the table, the distance is zero, and the book to the table is zero, but the distance between the cup and the book is not zero, which again violates the triangle inequality. So here is a little assignment again, and I hope you're not believing after that. So I want you to create this, this confusion matrix from a, um, a real life problem that violates the triangle inequality, where the distance between two objects is not straight line. Would you think of, of an example? Yes, please. So you see, in, in Lebanon, we have the perfect example in politics. So you have one party <laughs> who's, who has a perfect alliance with another party, I'm not gonna say names in order, but I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure everyone knows what I'm talking about. And then the second party would go and have another alliance with the perfect enemy of the first party. 
and this is actually in ruling today. So, so who has another example of such violation by humans? No? You're Basically, airliners, when we travel by plane, uh, if you go, for example, if you want to go between here and, for let's say, for example, Romania, uh, it would be cheaper if you go to Britain and then take a flight from Britain to Romania rather than going from here to Romania, for example, even though fuel costs are cheaper if we go directly, right? So shortest path is straight line, like the crow flies, but in reality, it is something different. So exactly, you're saying by looking to the cost as a distance, it is much shorter to go through a longer trajectory than to go directly, which is... Any other example? Okay, I think we had enough. So actually, it is very normal, very natural to be non-metric. We all non-metric. And we still, most of the approaches used, they claim to be machine learning, by the way. And in statistics, they are using metric approaches. Drugs for healthcare are validated by clinical trials, which they use the normal distribution to approve the drug in clinical trials. They fit uh, all the patient's population in a normal distribution to validate that the drug is working. And now what you have, the drug is in the market, and guess what? Everyone is an outlier. They don't fit that distribution. And not just for drugs. Policies are validated in the same way. What programs they, they teach our children at schools, they are validated in a similar way on smaller group of people because they assume that the central limit theorem will fit the data and they can generalize. Another example, yes? Uh, I'm guessing that you're saying something like political surveys also for a normal distribution, yet they have a high chance of success, not necessarily in numbers, but in predictability. So how do you, um, either they're using something different, which I would like to know, or they are ac there is actually some correlation or causality between both. And uh, what would you say to that? So the, by using the non-metric approaches for validation of policies uh, by politics or for validating the outcome for a drug, we don't fit a normal distribution. We use 100% data-driven approach. What we use, all the data that we have available to predict that specific outcome for that specific person, even if he is on the tail of the distribution, even if he is an outlier, we don't exclude him. What you see now, in many of those industries, they apply inclusion and exclusion criteria. If you are old and you have complications and diabetes, oh, we exclude you from the analysis because you, you, you will introduce bias. Um, and the same for, uh, for every policy. And um, that's the thing that we do differently in machine learning. We predict, not just in, so there are approaches in machine learning that still exclude if you use the metric methods. So another example is the sound, the, 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 the speed of the sound. The speed of the sound through the ground, it's, mass, it's, it's much faster. So it's not just our behavior. We're not just those strange creatures with this no-metric behavior. Animals, nature, it's, it's just geometrical laws that obey the triangle inequality. Another ex example is our perception. So what you see here, which one is bigger? It's the same size, but our perceptions, our eye does see this as bigger because we put our semantics on that, our emotion, we know it. So, um, and the same here, if you look from the left to the right, what do you see? And from the right to the left. Yes, so it is again how we see things. And um, that's all proofs that we are known metric creatures. And it's the same example here. So I want to, um, to conclude uh, with a few things before having a discussion. That 
that actually what makes us experts in what we do is not by being very rational, being very logic and very firm, no, but being human by combining both our, our logical thinking and our emotion. So that makes us uh, experts, our intuition. So, and the other thing is that the distance or, or how we achieve our dis decisions, the best decisions we achieve is not by using our rationals only, it's by having a no straight line to the, those decisions. And answering the question how machine learning can solve those problems is because we accept that, we accept we are not perfect, and we accept that people are not uh, metric doesn't need to obey the triangle inequality and that um, the, the shortest distance is not always a straight line and we always give a prediction for everyone even if he doesn't fit our perfect image and <coughs> all of these I want to say if we look now to the applications of machine learning on the different markets what we see is <coughs> machine learning is used for prediction of fraud prediction of churning customers, prediction of dying per patients. And it is a shame because um, what we want to build is build trust, trust in the future, uh, especially if we look, for example, to industries like the financial system. It's all based on building trust in the future, but now it's used a lot in, in protecting ourselves from the fear from others. Well, the whole theory of machine learning is based on accepting everyone, even if it is an outlier. So I, I would say people here from the hackathon, from uh, people studying machine learning, use it for the trust, for building trust. Use it to solve real problems. Use it to find your genuine customers or high value customers and not to just build walls to divide and label everyone in the society. And now, please, I want to use the, the remaining time of the uh, presentations for, for you to share and you to ask questions about this. Thank you. So, yeah. Thank you. So, what I have a question is, um, consider something like the prisoner's dilemma right, but without external forces. The rational decision is obviously not the best choice, right, because everyone loses. Um, in cases where you are dealing with data where the rational decisions are not so obvious, how do you go about, uh, because we don't know them, right? Prisoner's dilemma is simple if we have two people, if you expand it, it becomes much more difficult. Uh, how do you go about building machine learning to solve those kinds, or at least give a uh, strong indication of if you follow this kind of path, there is a probability of success X. So how do you go about building those kinds of machine learning, basically? To basically answer questions of the form of prisoner's dilemma. Uh, where, you know, two people who are caught, basically, uh, if they cooperate without knowing, they end up in a better situation. But rationally, if uh, one of them sells the other, um, the other person gets a lot uh, in a much worse situation. If they both sell each other out, they both lose. So the only way where you actually win is if uh, you do the non-rational decision and you uh, don't rat out your friend. But rationally, the only thing to do is uh, basically rat out your friend. And the only way um, prisoner dilemma becomes solvable is if you have a mob guy outside is going to kill you if you rat up your friends, right? So now you change the problem. And that's the external force. So how would you go about solving those kinds of kinds of problem with machine learning. So thank you. It's the first time I heard about this dilemma. But I would say for any dilemma, um, and many dilemmas include the emotional side sometimes much, much more than the rational side, I would say experience and skills. Two things. First, the experience is coming by seeing as much examples from real life as possible like a doctor that see every day so many patients as possible. And the skills, the skills is finding out the resources, what we, said, what we saw here as the curse of the emotionality. What is the resources you need to find out if it is class one or class two, if it is going to end in 
what, what did you say? And uh, going out together or... To find those resources, you need to um, constantly keep asking yourself which people in your life add value to you, which resources add value to you in your job, and not focus all your attention on, on everything, but only find your inner circle for that problem solving. And that's how to become an expert in something, as well as learning, keeping learning. Hi, thanks for the great talk. Um, my, my background is medical, and there's an interesting point you mentioned about how we shouldn't be labeling things, and just focusing on the medical aspect of it, I just wonder whether if we improve the quality of our labeling, if we label more, would we get better data, and can we then revert back to the metric input? So for example, rather than us um, excluding certain people, if we include every single person and subset stratify all the data we have, would our data then not conform to the central limit theorem? So in other words, a lot of the examples you provided today, it appears to be almost metaphysical. But if we strip it back down to the bare basics, the chemical and the physical compositions, and if we go back to the human bodies where we go back to the physiological pathways, including the genome and our understanding of it, we do not find that all our data does in fact go back to the uh, metric uh, predictions. It is a very good question. It's the, the, the known metric approaches work especially well on the high level. On the high level, especially when there is human inference involved, nature inference, it's not just what I saw with the sound distance, when there is interpretation of things, when there is a, a physical uh, medium that transforms the signal, either it's a human being, either it's a material like the ground makes the sound run faster, then we need these known metric distances. We need to hack those distances and find that short distance. Once we go more low, low level, once we talk about signal features that are very small, like the particles, like the cells, then we might see that metric approaches for specific features work. I think there is m higher probability that the central limit theorem will fit on much, much low level signal than on the high level. But as you, as you know as a doctor, the data we collect, it's all high level. What we collect is age, gender, ethnicity, um, sometimes type of food, it's all high level. There is always a, a medium of transformation, either it's the human being, either it's the culture, either it's... so. It, and that's why those, uh, the central limit theorem doesn't fit. Hi. Uh, we as humans, we have ethics, values, and principles that guide, enable, limit our decisions. But concerning machine, how can we implement these values, principles, in order to take a, uh, an appropriate decision concerning ethics, like the ethical dilemma? I think the ethics, it's, it's, it's even higher level than what we do. Um, that's that's th something that we well thought of, people think about it, and smart people. And um, sometimes, as I said, the use of machine learning today sometimes is unethical. I actually worked with a client, they call it responsive gambling, which basically in a gaming sector, trying to help people that are gambling and addicted to stop. But mainly, m it is used to make addictive gamblers, gamblers not stop, so, which is not ethical. And they, they can't stop because, as I said, c'est plus fort que... <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's harder. So I think that is up to the designer. That's up to you guys when you are designing such a system later that you keep those ethics in mind, as well as the doctor keeps those ethics in mind. And if you think that the direction you're implementing machine learning for is not adding value, is labeling, is, um, um, is building walls to divide people, then you should stop. Then you should consider to do something else. And, and that's the ethics of the engineer that uh, uh, gets involved. Yes, question in the back.
uh, I just want to share something. Uh, I don't think the problem is in the rational thinking itself. I think in a very ideal and perfect and impossible world, rational th thinking is a good solution. But the problem is in rational thinking, we have two problems. One of them is we don't have access to, to uh, all the data. We will never have access to data, but in a very perfect parallel universe, if we have access to all the data and all the possibility, rational thinking, I think, would be the, the option. And another uh, problem with rational thinking is the processing time. So if we, let's say, if we want to do the perfect vacation, if we spend three years, it will be the perfect, but we lost the three years, which caused other problems. The baby is grown up and other issues, you know? So I think the problem when we say rational thinking, I, sh I think it, it should be related to the processing time and the data. That's why it's a problem to have uh, rational thinking in this aspect. So we use our intuition and other stuff to make decisions. That's the problem, I think. Yeah, thank you. This is, this is so true. Yes, it is. Um, if, if we live in a perfect world and we have all the information, the central limit theorem will work and we will be very happy to have it and we don't need to see so many examples to, have, to reach the consensus. And that's not true, we know that. And the other thing, the time, I, that reminds me of, uh, of a professor of mine when the, the flat TVs arrived, he spent so much time to find the perfect TV in a price and in the, um, uh, all the technical conditions. And after two months, he found it and he was so happy with that. And then he came home and then his wife, she said, oh, okay, yeah. You spent a lot of time on that. If the price you reduced in finding the cheapest one you could have earned much more on if you spend this on, on consulting work you do, or, which, is, which is true. And uh, yeah, I agree. <laughs> Any more? Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, do you think uh, that uh, there is some uh, instruments that uh, all of it's uh, harmful uh, to the society? Uh, uh, this is uh, related to the uh, uh, ethics of the uh, production, uh, like uh, mind reading instruments. This m mind reading instruments. Uh, this uh, instrument, I, s I see it uh, that have all uh, disadvantages and harmful. Yes, yeah, so as, as I said, um, the ethics of, of not just the processing part, what do you want to predict, but also the data collection part, data privacy, that's as a designer, if you're in that position, I think that's the ethics you should have as an engineer, as many professions, as judges, as doctors, and, and you need to keep asking yourself the question, am I doing the right thing? And, and that's unfortunately not up to the machine, the machine learning. Um, uh, algorithms as well as the, the computers that we use for, for building these algorithms are just a tool and you can use it for the good or for the bad. Any more? Yeah. There is one, one there, yeah. Thanks. Hi. Hi. I want to ask a technical question. Yes. Uh, in the implementation of machine learning, sometimes we need algorithms, sometimes we need code. Do you recommend any open source or, I don't know, uh, um, some said, reference yeah. or anything else? As I said, um, so machine learning, the, the majority of the algorithms were developed in the 70s. Um, there is a lot of work coming from Russian mathematicians and most of the algorithms like neural networks, like nearest neighbors, they were developed a long time ago. The skill, which is ignored, it's not about the algorithm. The algorithm is, a, is like a black box. You need to understand the algorithm, that's true, but what you put into the algorithm, which features you put from the expert you want to, to use to train your algorithm, that's the key. Because as we said, giving too much criteria to the algorithm will lead us to the curse of the, the, uh, the emotionality as well as we get misleaded when we have too much criteria to make a decision. So the trick is not about which algorithm to use, it's about what information we extract and how we process it to give it to the algorithm. So it's about pre-processing, feature definition, and feature selection. 
Uh, one last question. I was, uh, in case of code, if, if you want some code to implement it, do you recommend any? Um, C code or Java code or anything else? Every, everything is fine. So I use, as, as a computer scientist, you use everything. If you want scripting, Python is great. R is used by many. Um, if you want something um, uh, real time, you go to OpenCV, C++. Uh, if you want something uh, fancy on Java, on the cloud, depends on what you really want. Thank you. Do we still have time? Okay, so thank you, thank you very much for staying. Oh, there is one more, one more, <laughs> sorry, one more. So you mentioned that uh, to avoid the curse of dimensionality, we need to uh, ignore some criteria. And how do you, sele how do you select which uh, cri criteria can safely be ignored? That's the, the magic to do that is testing. And it's in real life. So how do you know that if some people add value to you or not? You have that interaction on daily with them, but you see if you, you have come from a dinner and you're empty, you're, you're, you just spend some time, and again and again, you just, it doesn't work anymore. The same with machine learning. You test, you select your samples from the data, for example, randomly, and you train, and you rank the features, and you see this is important, this is important, this is, important, this is not. You repeat it again, repeat it again, until like a thousand times, and then you see, okay, those are my important things, they keep coming on the top, 20, and my curve stops there, then you cut. So we, when you, we look back to the uh, curse of dimensionality, you stop before it gets stable, before it starts going up. And you exclude all the features that m are dominant in that side. So um, yeah, thank you so much. And uh,